Now, in your book, you've discussed how people can become habituated to tyranny and abusive government policies. I, I suppose you mean over time when certain policies policies are enacted and they become progressively more horrific, kind of like a frog boiling in hot water. I mean, presumably if the government were to ban all civil rights tomorrow, uh, there would be revolts, right? The least smile producing chapter in the book, we had a lot of fun of the book, is about the rise of Nazism. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it wasn't, you know, like really slow, it wasn't 30 years, but it was incremental. Hitler didn't have concentration camps and complete suppression of uh, various things in the first months. It was it happened over time. Our next guest is a professor at Harvard Law School. He is Cass Sunstein, and we'll be talking about his new book, uh, Look Again, The Power of Noticing What Was Always There. Professor uh, Sunstein, it's an honor to host you. Welcome to the show. An honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You've um, you've worked for the Pentagon's Defense Innovation Board uh, in 2020. The World Health Organization has appointed you as the chair of their Behavioral Insights Group and from 2009 to 2012, you worked as an administrator at the Obama White House administration. Uh, what fascinates you about your line of work before we talk about your book itself? If I were to nail down one or two things that excites you the most from your work and all the experiences that I've highlighted, what would those things be? Well, thank you for that. Uh, in government, the most exciting thing is if you can help people. So if there's an initiative that can help people prosper economically, that's fantastic. If there's something that can reduce death and illness, that's uh, unbelievably an honor to get to participate in that. If there's something that can help companies start and prosper, that's fabulous. If there's something that can uh, help people be safer on the job, that's also really great. Uh -huh. So with the government work, those are the uh, greatest honors imaginable. In terms of academic work, if there's an idea that's maybe not entirely uh, old that people can use that can help with something if it involves behavioral economics, especially, which is my favorite area. And the reason I love it so much is a lot of the findings are surprising at first. You go, really? And then you go, oh, yeah, definitely. And that really question mark followed by definitely, that's kind of the hallmark of work in behavioral science. Yes. In your book, um, Look Again, you talked about how humans get habituated to certain things in our lives. Can you give us a few examples of habits that we develop that may be hard to let go? Yeah, I'll give some examples that are yeah. a little shocking and some okay. examples that are a little fun. So shocking is uh, there's experimental data that shows if people are given an economic incentive to lie. You know, the first few times they will they will lie if the economic incentive is there and the amygdala the part of the brain that fires when people feel ashamed of themselves among other things is firing so people lie they make money and they're ashamed after the five lies ten lies by the end of the day they're lying 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 the amygdala is completely quiet uh, it's as if it's not even registering the fact of a lie so people's own immorality people habituate to, they get used to it. And I think that explains a lot around the world that people habituate to their own wrongdoing. Or what's meant by habituation is they're decreasingly sensitive to it. And that's kind of shocking. Uh, here's something a little more comical that the best time of a vacation, if you're on a vacation on a beach, the best time in is 43 hours in. After that, it gets a little less wonderful. That's because people are in some beautiful place, but they're kind of used to it. And the magnificence of the water, the ocean, the beach, that's not quite as uh, amazing after those first 43 hours. I'm curious if you extended the same research to marriages, <laughs> if you've been habituated that's to a spouse. There's a bit on that in the book. And uh, the data show that uh, people kind of habituate to their own partners and their romantic interest over time uh, diminishes, sometimes a lot, not because the person isn't so amazing, but because you're used to the person. And as one of the great uh, therapists and students of romance says, fire needs air. And that's without space, people habituate, and a person is a little like a vacation. 
to trying to get used to them. Going back to what you said about people lying for economic gains, and you said that they feel ashamed afterward. How would, how were you able to assess uh, that level of shame? Okay, so in the study, which was done by my co-author, Tali Sharat, who's a neuroscientist, uh, there's actually a mon brain monitor attached to people in the study mm -hmm. that was not, it was visible, they knew it. It wasn't so obtrusive that they couldn't go about their uh, activity, and you could actually see the amygdala firing in the first lies, and you could see the amygdala quieting after a while. And it's like you go into a room, let's say there's some bad smell there, the first minute is going to be horrible, and maybe the first uh, 10 minutes are going to be not so good, but 30 minutes in, you might not notice the smell at all. You go swimming in cold water or you go into a bath that's hot and people desensitize to the cold and hot such that you tell your friend the water's fine and the friend starts going in and it's freezing and says, what do you mean? You say you'll get used to it and you're right. So does this apply to any bad behavior with any sort of economic incentive whatsoever? Um, the universality of habituation is such that probably the best general answer is yes. So people get used to, for example, wealth, so that you might have a job that is paying you a lot, or you might have work that you would have died to get five years ago. And once you've been in the job or had the money, uh, you habituate to it and are less thrilled by it, which helps explain a lot about the complicated relationship between economic gain or up the ladder and uh, people's emotional response to those successes. They tend to soften over time. People get used to the fact that they're doing really well. There are things we can do, by the way, to make the fact that we have maybe a great job or a decent economic situation to make that re-sparkle. Suppose somebody lies in your, in your studies. Suppose somebody lies, gets away with it. They become habituated to this pattern. Uh, would they increasingly up their ante? In other words, would they seek greater rewards uh, despite perhaps greater recourse without feeling additional shame, Professor? Okay, there's some great old studies that suggest the answers in the ballpark of yes. There are old studies of people's willingness to obey in order to hurt someone. These were studies where people would apply what they thought was an electric shock to a stranger, and the shocks would get more and more intense over time. And the shocking finding of the data is that ordinary people are going to apply very painful shocks to strangers. Now, that finding masks the fact that in the study, there were slow increments of shocking. So you start out by shocking someone a little bit, doesn't hurt so much. Then it's more than a little bit, hurts a little bit. Then it's more than that. It hurts kind of medium. And then over time, you're shocking them more and more. Yes. So people are habituating to their own negative uh, activity and they go for it. Uh, with respect to lying, I think there's every reason to believe that lies will snowball over time. Now, whether people need the kick of, let's say, a big lie and a big reward, that we don't have data on, but their own habituation to their immoral action is highly likely to be present. Now, um, people are wondering whether or not uh, it's likely that people will repeat their bad behavior if they were caught. Suppose, let's say we have a Bernie Madoff type example where somebody swindled your money. Let's say they went to jail. Uh, they've been reformed, so to speak. They've been rehabilitated. They came out and for some reason or other, they are able to start in the business again, uh, assuming they were completely disbarred. So would you trust that person is the core question. On the one hand, you could argue, well, he's been rehabilitated. He learned his lesson. On the other hand, you could argue um, perhaps there's research to suggest that once he's been a crook, he's always going to be a crook. What does your research suggest? Okay, so that's a, thank you for the reference to Bernie Madoff. That's uh, that's perfect because it's very probable that his own uh, bad behavior, let's say, was a product of his own habituation to what he was starting to do. And uh, this can be about receiving uh, lies from others, or cruelty or unkindness from others, or economic Ill, uh, 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 bad deeds from others. We can get used to it and kind of say it is what it is. 
Now, with respect to someone who's been punished, uh, we don't have data on that, but I'll give you an informed hunch, which is that the person who's been punished is likely still have been habituated to his or her own wrongdoing. So I wouldn't trust that person with my, my money, but I'd be aware that having been punished, the person might not have the internal check on their own wrongdoing because they've habituated to it, but they might be scared of the authorities. So they might have an external check knowing uh, I don't think it's so terrible or I'm not going to uh, be ashamed of myself so much if I do it, but there are people watching me. So uh, um, criminal punishment can deter future misconduct, not because it dishabituates people so their conscience is triggered, but because it scares them that something bad is going to happen if they do something wrong. What ultimately motivates people to conduct financial or economic crimes? I'm not talking about petty crimes or um, any of that sort. I'm talking about people like Bernie Madoff. Is it is it their personality? Is it their family background? Is it their lack of wealth? growing up or surplus of wealth or, you know, just overall social status um, in society. What is it, Professor? Okay, so there's a, 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 a an assortment of answers to that question. So if you find a financial wrongdoer, there will be different stories which will be accurate about their own wrongdoing. Something that probably unifies the wrongdoing is that they have uh, scaled up over time. So they've habituated to their own misconduct, just as people habituate to, let's say, uh, air pollution or lack of freedom or to poverty. Mm -hmm. That people habituate to all of those things such that poverty is never wonderful and air pollution is never great. But if people who are middle class are suddenly thrown into poverty, it has an OMG reaction, which outruns what people will have if they have lived in poverty for a long time. Not wonderful, maybe horrible, but not the kind of OMG. Now, with respect to people who do financially bad things, sure. probably they've scaled up over time. Now, why did they start and why do they continue? It might be that they had desperate need. It might be that in some sense they get off on their own wrongdoing. It might be there's um, desperation or power, hunger. And these various tales have uh, different characteristics. Mm -hmm. But habituation is highly likely to be consistent across the territory. Well, let's suppose I'm looking for a business partner to work with. I just met the guy. Um, he seems genuine, but I don't know. What should I be looking for? Are any indicators I should be watching to indicate to me whether or not he's going to A, tell the truth, be honest and forthright in his business um, in transactions and inter interactions with me, or if he's going to be a sociopath and lie and carry out uh, misdeeds? Well, there's uh, some great advice I got from my co-author and hero, Daniel Kahneman, who's one of the founders of behavioral economics, who said, if you want uh, advice from someone, find someone who likes you, but doesn't care about your feelings. I'll get to your question in a moment. That's a beautiful answer, because what he's saying is, if, if there's someone who cares about your feelings, they won't give you an honest answer. If it's someone who doesn't like you, they'll give you an answer that'll hurt you. So if you find someone who likes you but doesn't care about your feelings with respect to, let's say, economics or romance or health, uh, they, they that's the best advice uh, giver you can find. Now, if you have a business partner who has those characteristics, that's also very positive. It should be someone who likes you because then they care about your welfare, mm -hmm. not just the laugh at your, jo your jokes, but they really think that your well-being matters to them. But if they don't care about your feelings, meaning they're willing to tell you something that maybe in the moment you don't want to hear, then they're 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 a good partner. They'll tell you you're maybe being a little reckless or you're being a little too cautious. Of course, you want someone who's good to deal with. And I think that's often underrated in business, that people often want an amazing person. It's also good to have someone who's good to deal with, because if they're amazing but bad to deal with, you're going to hate your days working with them. You might make a lot of money, but it might not be worth it because it's going to be a terrible year. But if they're good to work with and they're also going to help you make money, 
uh, that's great. There might be some clues in their history about whether they're going to be honest with you. And uh, uh, to track that down is probably a pretty good idea. If you can find incidents of dishonesty in the past or creepiness in the past, um, whatever red color is associated with that, you should see it as a bit brighter uh -huh. because they probably situated to their own uh, ill deeds. I interview traders all the time, and some of the most commonly recurring questions that I've been asked um, to me is, can you ask such and such trader how he fixes his old bad habits? In other words, um, he may be accustomed to trading a certain way because he has a method, but if that method has been proven to be incorrect, how does one get out of that habit if you've already been habituated to such a methodology? Okay, so uh, we find that people fall in two categories, and this will be relevant. There are explorers and there are exploiters. Explorers are people who think the idea of a staycation is really terrible and who want to go to the new restaurant in town rather than the one that's tried and true. Exploiters love the idea of a staycation. They want to exploit not other people. They want to exploit their own experiences and their own stock of knowledge. And uh, exploiters are people who will be a little stick in the mud, but also not going to uh, go jumping off a very high diving board. Okay. Uh, a risk with traders is that some people are exploiters in the sense that they know their own ways and they're very cautious or averse to doing something different even if the thing that they've been doing isn't really working. So my suggestion is if you find someone who professionally with respect to money is, is an exploiter type, um, be nervous that they their capacity for self-correction will be limited by virtue of their uh, enthusiasm about relying on their existing stock of practices and understandings. Mm -hmm. How long does it usually take to develop a new habit or break an old one? Well, we don't have a number for that, and it varies across persons. Mm -hmm. So there are people for whom uh, old habits are sleep-inducing. And one thing we find is that uh, the midlife crisis is uh, present in numerous nations in approximately the same period of life. And one reason for it is that people are stuck in uh, a gray world which is the world that their, let's say, 60-year-old self is in, and that's depressing. And a 20-year-old is in a world that's full of color because they're not habituated. Yeah. If you are in a, in a gray world, the ability to make uh, break habits will, will be uh, 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 dampened down. And that's why there's heterogeneity across persons. So with respect to trading behavior, uh, there, there wouldn't be a number and there would be diversity dependent on both culture and personality. Now, in your book, you've discussed how people can become habituated to tyranny and abusive government policies. I, I suppose you mean over time when certain policies, policies are enacted and they become progressively more horrific, kind of like a frog boiling in hot water. I mean, presumably if the government were to ban all civil rights tomorrow, uh, there would be revolts, right? Can you expand on your thesis here? Thank you for that. So the least smile-producing chapter in the book, we had a lot of fun in the book, is about the rise of Nazism. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it wasn't, you know, like really slow. It wasn't 30 years, but it was incremental. Hitler didn't have concentration camps and complete suppression of... Uh, various things in the first months. It was it happened over time. And people who lived through Nazism, in retrospect, said it was like a field where th things were growing. And you couldn't really tell until at one point they were over your head. So the, the rise of authoritarianism often has a lot to do with habituation, where people see something that's kind of out of line, or maybe worse than out of line. And they think that's that's bad, but not that bad. And then the next month there's something that's like it, but maybe 10% worse. And they think, oh, that's kind of like that, but a little worse. And then after a period of years, it might be horror. And it, there wasn't a rebellion. And just as you say, if an authoritarian leader had acted 
let's say, in the worst imaginable fashion in year one, that people wouldn't have stood for it. Certainly we're not seeing examples of this today, are we? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion of uh, democratic backsliding. So the fact is that studies of what's happening in various nations all over the world have um, identified uh, incremental deterioration of various kinds. Um, Turkey is, is, is an example of democratic backsliding. And there's some data suggesting uh, the United States has observed some of that as well. And while I love my country and have not only high hopes, but reverence for it, uh, the idea that there's been a series of challenges to uh, democratic ideals in the United States, I think both Republicans and Democrats would agree with that. Uh, Professor, can you give us some examples of these challenges that you just highlighted? Well, there are some nations in which freedom of speech is less protected today than it was the day before yesterday. And uh, um, in some nations, I, I love our fellow, uh, our, our fellow, let's say humans. So I don't want to be very critical of people in particular countries. But uh, you can see nations. And I did mention Turkey, where there's been significant backsliding. There have been some developments in India that have been extraordinary and impressive, but some developments that from the standpoint of democracy have been very much less than ideal in the last years. Um, in Russia and China, there have been developments that haven't been, let's say, improvements in the direction of democracy and respect for liberties, even though there have been developments in China in particular that have right. been economically very impressive, extraordinarily impressive. And at times in China over the last 40 years, there have been movements in favor of freedom, but we're not seeing, let's say, uh, uh, accelerating uh, improvements in the direction of freedom in China. And in some ways, we've seen the opposite. And that's uh, that's an example. So you've actually written quite a bit about misinformation, disinformation um, in one of your prior books. Now, the U.S. First Amendment protects freedom of speech, but we know that it could go too far, as you've written about before. So what is the correct, in your opinion, the correct government policy to balance freedom of speech versus protecting citizens from misinformation? Well, we have categories that are well established, and they're actually related to habituation. So um, if you're told that if you buy my book, uh, uh, you're actually never going to get heart disease. Um, and then the reason is that the book has some things in it that are inoculation against heart disease. And heart disease is really terrible, but this particular book reduces the incidence. I just did something, which is I've associated my book three times falsely with the reduction of heart disease. There's something called the illusory truth effect, which is, yeah. says that if something's repeated various times, it's easy to process. And as a result of ease of processing, people habituate and are more likely to believe it. So that's a problem. Um, for the government to handle falsehoods with a, let's say, uh, nuclear bomb would not be a very good idea, because to trust the government to know what's true or false would be uh, a mistake, and to allow some breathing space for uh, truth and falsehood is also a good idea. So if I said that... Um, Peyton Manning's the greatest quarterback in the history of the National Football League, or if I said that Taylor Swift is less good than Selena Gomez, both of those statements would be false. But to, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback in the history of the National Football League, and Taylor Swift, Selena Gomez is very good, but Taylor Swift is better. To put people at risk of criminal sanctions because they expressed a falsehood with respect to those things would chill debate, so we want some room. Uh, on the other hand, if I said sincerely, rather than for illustration purposes, that if you buy my book, you won't get heart disease, that's fraud. And we do not allow fraud, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. 
perjury is not allowed, and that's fine. If you tell the FBI in the context of trying to get a federal job uh, something false about your background, that's against the law too, and that's fine. So there's actually an implicit theory in our law about falsehoods, which is we're looking at the intention of the speaker. If I say Taylor Swift is not as good as Selena Gomez, probably I actually mean it. I'm not intentionally making a mistake. Uh, the harm caused, if I say something wrong about who's the greatest football player, uh, maybe the great Tom Brady would be a little sad, but it wouldn't be harmful. If I tell the FBI something false about my background, then I would end up with federal employment on the basis of false pretenses. And that that is a quite bad thing. So we're looking at the state of mind of the speaker, the magnitude of the harm, and also the correctability of the harm. If someone perjures themselves, it's not easy to uh, fix it, and it might be impossible to fix it. If someone says, let's say, climate change isn't real, in my view, that's false, but we have a system of free speech where the falsehood can be corrected. I believe it was uh, Joseph Goebbels Minister of Propaganda from Nazi Germany. Well, it was believed that he said that something like, if you tell a lie big enough and often enough, it becomes truth. Is there a psychological um, truth behind that statement? Yes, there are two psychological findings. One is the truth bias. If I told you, for example, that uh, today Tiger Woods announced his retirement from golf, and the reason is he's decided to run as an independent candidate for president. Mm -hmm. I just told you that. that's false. Uh, for you and anyone listening to this, there's going to be a part of the mind, and I apologize for this, that is going to think for a while now, is Tiger Woods running for president? <laughs> Even though I told you immediately that it was false. So the truth bias means when we hear something, we tend to assume it's so, even if in real time it's corrected, or even if we have very strong reason to believe it's not so. The illusory truth effect, as noted, suggests that there's power in repetition, and uh, propagandists of multiple kinds have known this. So if I said over and over and over again something false about a political figure, let's say, yeah. say about President Obama or something, if I said something very false about him over and over, it would have power. And it's because of the ease of processing. That's the habituation effect. If you hear that German shepherds are the best dogs of all 17 times, then you hear it, it's going to be very easy to process that. Actually, Labrador retrievers are even better than German shepherds. Um, people do say that a lot. So that truthful statement is widely believed, thank goodness. Mm. Uh, ultimately, for investors and traders alike, maybe you watch this program, it's difficult to defer between truth and falsehood when you're watching the news, media, going on social media, so on and so forth. Um, is there a system that you recommend people to use to verify information, fact check, double check, um, basically get to the truth of the matter of whatever, whatever it is that they're reading? Yeah, the reliable sources. So okay. we need to have that in bold letters and from the sky. So. One of my fields is constitutional law. And if someone tells me something about a Supreme Court decision in 1935, I can look it up for reliable sources and see what the Supreme Court actually said. If there's a statement about health, there are reliable sources and there are trading related things that you can find, though admittedly the rumor mill is very fast and sometimes hard in uh, immediate time to, be able to penetrate. Uh, finally, uh, tell us something else about your book that uh, I I uh, haven't brought up yet. Something interesting that you found uh, in the research uh, that you've done uh, in the writing of the book that you can share with us. Thank you. And this is for traders in particular. Yeah. Uh, if, if you have a task that you are really enjoying, break it up into segments. And if you're doing something that you really don't like, that you find boring, motor through. Don't chop it up. And it turns out that for good experiences, people typically believe the best thing to do is just to keep at it. Don't break it up. That's what intuition suggests. It's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is if you're enjoying something, you're going to habituate to it and like it less over time. If you break it up into, let's say, three segments, 
then you will have the amazement of enjoying it anew three times and you won't habituate. So good tasks we should chop up. A bad task, you know, something that a trader does that he or she doesn't really like, uh, to motor through is good because you habituate it to it to it as you motor through and you don't have the horrible uh, experience twice of embarking on a task you really don't like. So break up the good and motor through the bad. Traders have been habituated uh because we're humans to react on emotion. So suppose I have a losing position. My gut instinct may tell me to get rid of that position because the stock may go down more. But because I'm emotional, I want to earn back the gains, hold it for longer. That may yield a worse outcome. How can we as humans learn to be, I guess, less emotional in our thinking when it comes to trading? Is that something that you even advocate for? Be an algorithm. Be an algorithm, be a database creature. So with respect to stock trading, I try to be an algorithm. And to the extent that I struggle, I call my co-author Dick Thaler. And I say, I want to sell now. I'm getting really upset. And he said, didn't you read our book? Yeah. <laughs> said, yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, Professor, for... Uh sharing your insights, your new book, uh, Look Again, The Power of Noticing, What Was Always There. Where can we find it? You can find it everywhere. There's this new thing online, it begins with A, I think it's called Amazon, which they tell those books and amazingly you can get them delivered. The book Look Again is available on Amazon, but it's also available on Barnes and Noble and independent bookstores. If it isn't available at your store, I would say to them, Look again is the title of the book, and they ought to follow the advice of the title. Excellent. Uh, and uh, where else can we find samples of your work or read about you, uh, your bio? Well, my my book Nudge with Dick Thaler is is very easy to find, and okay. we did a new edition in 2021. If you put my name in uh, Amazon, chances are you're going to find more than one book. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Sunstein. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to uh, stay tuned for Professor's book and uh, subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for more.